Hello, I'm Leanne Young. This is a big month for taking trips. Today we have stories that touch on travel, but not exactly in the way you think. This is our Vancouver. Coming up, one man's quest for a cheap ride to Whistler turns into big business. And a special dance to mark the start of a new Persian century by acknowledging loved ones lost on Flight 752. But first, where there's a will, there's a way. The unlikely story of a flight attendant and international art collector. There's a public art show on now featuring the collection of a very private man. Gerd Metzdorf was not rich or famous. He was a flight attendant who uses international travel per diems to invest in works by Andy Warhol and Cindy Sherman, just to name a few. Metzdorf died in 2020, but the art collection is now on display at Griffin Art Projects in North Vancouver until early May. Grant Mann was a lifelong friend and a fellow art collector. Thanks for joining us today, Grant. Hi. So how did you get to know Gerd Metzdorf? Um, we met in the Vancouver West End, um, just in the community, and uh, we got to know one another, and the conversation instantly turned to art and art collection. And um, I soon discovered that Garrett had a real passion, as I did, for collecting art, and we became fast friends. Um, it was in the late 80s uh, and into the early 90s when we... Um, uh, really started to uh, share that passion together. Very cool. And I know you guys were friends for a long, long time, many decades. So how did he actually get into collecting art? Um, well, he trained as a flight attendant with uh, Canadian Airlines. And when he started to fly overseas, he immediately started to collect um, art. By He would go around to the museums and the galleries and he'd... Um, you know, read up in the magazines and the periodicals about art, and he'd go to the shows, and uh, yeah, he used his per diems um, to, uh, saved up his per diems and used those as, uh, to get himself started. Yeah, it was really, really interesting. Really, really interesting. He sounded just fanatical about art. Why was it so important to him? Um, you know, I'd asked him a number of times where his passion came from, um, I think he liked to collect. As a kid, he was collecting coins and he was collecting stamps. And then he started collecting Canadian art history books. And I think this led him into a real interest in art. And then with the modern art era booming and, and really starting to evolve and come into its own in the early 70s, he saw it as a unique opportunity to, to really follow and develop his own passion. Cool. And he was a flight attendant for 40 years. So over that time, what kind of art did he collect? You know, what's in that collection? Uh, well, the collection is really quite varied. He uh, was really focused on contemporary fine art and pop art from the 60s, 70s into the 80s. Um, it's a collection of really beautiful paintings. There is uh, a lot of photography. There are drawings. Um, uh, there's... Uh, great installation work and sculptural work as well. So it's really quite varied. So I know the collection is now in your hands. Of all his pieces that he owns, is there one that really stands out to you that you love the most? Um, yeah, it's in the exhibition. It's uh, Andy Warhol's cow print. Um, it was from the first show of Leo Castelli gave Andy Warhol, and it's this amazing cow. And um, I grew up in a dairy farm in Manitoba, so I have a, a real fondness for that print. It uh, reminds me of my childhood. Yeah, it's my favorite piece of all. That's awesome. I'm just jealous of anyone that can own a Warhol. What a story. So how influential, though, was Gerd in the art scene here in the city? I think very. Because he traveled so extensively, he could you know, talk to anyone and everyone about the art that he was seeing and the artists that he was excited about and the shows. And uh, he really was, uh, I think, quite, quite instrumental with the Contemporary Art Society when it was established in the 70s. And um, he was always excited to talk about the new art that he was, um, you know, focused on and the new artists and the new shows. And uh, 
yeah, he was a great guy. Our conversations were always, always, always kind of 99% of them were about art. Yeah. Wow. So what do you think Gerd would think now about this exhibit that's in his name? I think he'd be very pleased. You know, uh, he was a very private man. He, he's, he had a history of lending work to um, various galleries and shows. And, uh, you know, people got a chance to see, you know, bits and pieces of his collection. But this was a real opportunity through the Griffin Art Projects to really um, gather a whole bunch of his art and have it shown. Um, uh, Lisa Baldessari uh, was a curator and she did an amazing job of, of sifting through the pieces we made available. And um, there's so much work, Leanne, that we have um, part one of the exhibition is this year. It uh, opened in early February and goes through, through, through till May 8th. And then we're going to have a 2.0 part of the exhibition next summer. And we'll show some of the really amazing, large, beautiful paintings that are in the collection and other works. I can't wait to see it. So I want to know, though, long term, what is going to happen to the collection? What are you going to do with it, you think? Well, my husband and I have been um, collecting art for many, many years. And we have our own contemporary collection that we have now merged with the vast collection that Garrett has left for us. So we're in the middle of cataloging and um, really reviewing everything that's in the collection. Um, we are going to continue to manage this collection and um, we really want to uh, see what we can do to um, continue to lend works and make them available for uh, exhibition and shows. Well, thanks for sharing a bit of that with us today, Grant Mann. Really appreciate it. We look forward to seeing the collection of your friend, Gerd Metzdorf. Oh, I hope you enjoy the show. Do go see it. It's good to talk to you. This is our Vancouver. Here's a story about an innovative way to get you from point A to point B. It's a way to share the costs of travel and to reduce the environmental footprint. Papa Ride started back in 2015, and as Radio Canada's Julie Carpentier explains, it began with a man from France who wanted to go skiing in Whistler but couldn't figure out a way to get there. Flo de Villain came to BC for one reason only. So skiing is the, the reason why I moved to this part of the world. But back in 2010, he was finding it difficult to get to the ski hills, and it was costly. So he came up with the idea to bring drivers and passengers together on a website. Initially, it was really to solve a simple problem, which was how do we get from Vancouver to Whistler without spending $50 on a bus ticket. That simple ride to the ski hill became big business for Flo. And soon, he was making it his job, along with his roommate. But it wasn't just about the money. By increasing vehicle occupancy and cars, we're able to reduce people's individual carbon footprints. We're here in Squamish, halfway between Vancouver and Whistler. Squamish is one of the fastest growing cities in the country. So is the demand for rides to the ski station or the city. <laughs> Alicia McGregor is an avid climber. She doesn't want to own a car. She's concerned about her impact on the environment and wants to be part of a community. There's a lot of people that do the, the commute every day. Um, and so sometimes I, I'm encountering the same people over and over and we kind of catch up every time. You're making friends along the way. <laughs> what do you mean you're going to get in the car with somebody you don't know? Magali Vaudrin was skeptical when she first heard about the app, but she now takes passengers every single day. It's great. Sometimes sometimes you, you know right away that you won't have much to talk about, and that's okay. We listen to music. She works in Vancouver and has driven over 1,200 passengers. Gas isn't cheap, so it's definitely helping... Um, with gas money since I'm driving 180 kilometers every day. Papa Ride has gone from a side project for Flo to a company of 10 employees. We're at the uh, intersection of using innovation and technology to solve big problems like climate change. And for the co-founder, magic can happen when strangers sit in the same car. We've had people find jobs, people find new friends, we've had people find housing, we've had People find lovers, and I would say it's probably what keeps us going, is that it's, it's very real and it's very human. What started as a ride to the hills has become for Flo a much bigger trip. Julie Carpentier, Radio-Canada, Squamish. 
Time for one of our favorite features when we showcase a number of the photographs sent in by you, our audience. First, Jessica Martinez took in the full moon over Vancouver recently. Wow, it is hitting my eye like a big pizza pie in a good way. Thank you, Jessica. And Patricia Burns was at Ocean Park in South Surrey taking in this beautiful orange sky, breathtaking photo, Patricia. And finally, Cheryl Smith was at English Bay when it was just being sun-kissed. Lovely image. Thank you for that, Cheryl. Send us more. You can email them to bcphotos at cbc.ca. That's bcphotos, all one word, at cbc.ca. For the last three weeks, we've been following the work of independent filmmaker Julian Baisa. After two years of isolation and loneliness of the pandemic, he found moments where strangers connect with each other. Today, in our final episode, we go to the park. This project started as a reason to get out of the house. I'd go out on walks every week, take photos of strangers, and listen to their stories. But it's become more than that now. I see the world differently when I take photos. Beautiful moments become frozen in time. Strangers become characters. I started coming to this park during the pandemic, but I've since realized you don't really know a place until you get to know the locals. This is Miller. He's six. He's um, pretty blind. He has a cataract in his one eye. If we hadn't had him, I'd probably be in a much worse place because I think he is a big part of why I can feel a sense of purpose even on days when, you know, I don't have a lot going on and when he's being silly or just watching him struggle with his vision issues and just not even let it get him down and just keep living a full life is, is pretty inspiring. You know, you kind of wish you had some of his qualities sometimes of just being so resilient when it comes to facing adversity. I guess just when you're feeling sad or you're feeling a little more hopeless about what things are going on, you kind of just want to fake a smile or something. But it's it's surprising because when you choose to be more vulnerable, is those are your best memories almost when you just kind of have that moment and you, and you open up to somebody even if it's a stranger or something. So I, I really don't know what stops me from doing that more after even after you have a positive experience, but I guess it's just you feel embarrassed or you feel like uh, like you shouldn't be experiencing this problem, so it's easier to pretend you don't have it or something like this. It's not something in particular that I'm looking for, just people and the stories that make us who we are. Her name was Tana. There's very few Tanas in the world. And we were very close and I was very young, but it didn't work. Why didn't it work? I'm too stubborn. I was, I made a mistake. Well, you've heard the stories now. I've had two marriages and I'm still not satisfied. That's the loneliness I'm talking about. In other words, I get anxious sometimes when I realize I'm alone, right? But I also worry about failure as a man. My manhood will be a failure. That's what I worry about. And I question myself, well, how can you judge whether it's a failure or a success by my sense of personal responsibility? And that was really what was intro to my retirement program, my five years of searching for something to do other than my work. All these little funny things that I wished I could do when I was not working, I tried, right? but they didn't satisfy me. Only the work satisfied. Now the work becomes extremely important to me. Like it's nothing else, except maybe finding a partner that can understand what I'm talking about. And I find also most people don't think about what I talk about. I believe that human beings are commanders of the universe. We're here to make the universe work. If there's something I've learned, it's that in discovering how different we all are, I've also realized how fundamentally we are all the same. Coming up, they may have helped to save lives during the pandemic, but billions of disposable face masks are ending up in the ocean and harming marine life. 
Johanna Wagstaff looks into solutions to the growing problem. It was only a matter of time. Disposable face masks are not only ending up in our oceans, but they're negatively impacting marine life. That's according to new research from France, where scientists recreated tide pools as part of an experiment to see the effects of leaching chemicals from face masks. They wanted to start with keystone species. Those are organisms that help define an entire ecosystem. So they looked at small crustaceans, mussels, and snails. And what they found was alarming. Not only were the animals more stressed, in fact, 40% more agitated in some cases just by the physical presence of a face mask in their environment, but the chemicals also altered their behavior. Most notably, their ability to detect a mate and reproduce. Serious stuff. This study is part of an ongoing experiment. Next, the researchers want to see how those chemicals and impacts are working their way up the food chain all the way to humans. But there is some good news here. First of all, every time science is able to identify what exactly the problem and impacts are, it's much easier to find the right solution and ultimately convince the right policymakers. So this study will come in very handy as the world works together to produce the first international policy to tackle the plastic crisis, of which masks are a part of. 200 countries, Canada included, just signed on to work to create an international UN-backed treaty to address the entire life cycle of plastic. It's a growing crisis that knows no international borders. The hope is that this treaty can be as successful as the Montreal Protocol drawn up in 1989 to address ozone-depleting substances. It's still heralded as one of the greatest success stories of international collaboration. The plastic treaty is expected to begin in 2024, so stay tuned for all the details. And now, you're science smart. If you have a science question on your mind, send me a tweet, and I'll try to get an answer. This is our Vancouver. Well, we are approaching Nowruz, the Persian New Year, and according to the Persian calendar, it's the start of a new century on March 20th. For one local Persian Canadian, this milestone needed to be marked in a special way. Just watch. Samira Sadatian has practiced that dance 176 times, once for every victim of Flight PS752, the plane that was shot down in Iran in 2020. And she joins us now to talk about her dance. So, Samira, what's it like to have such mixed feelings about the new year and the century, thinking of the future, but also reflecting on the sadness of the past? Yeah, well, Sunday, March 20th at 8.33 a.m., um, it's the end of the old year and the beginning of the Persian New Year. And as you said, per, um, per the solar calendar, it's the beginning of the new century for us as well. It's the beginning of century 15. And I wanted to do something meaningful for this important moment in our lives. And my starting point was uh, what we have been suffering from in the current century and what we wish for in the new century. Uh, for us, the most tragic event was the downing of flight PS752, the consequent loss of 176 lives. Um, and almost two years later, unfortunately, justice has not been served in this case. So I believe the primary challenge of the current century has been a lack of justice in a world in which we live in. And then I decided to, given my um, passion for Persian dance, I decided to learn and perform a dance for Nowruz. This dance um, has been choreographed to a beautiful Persian traditional music with a beautiful poem by Saadi, a very famous poet. It's about the arrival of a spring, which is a symbol of rebirth, renewal, end of the dark days, and hope. And then I decided to practice this 176 times in memory of the victims of flight PS752 and with the hope that Justice would be served in this case and in any other open cases around the world in the new century. As I practiced it 176 times, I expressed the hope for justice for each individual soul. And that's 
that's why I named this dance the Century of Hope. It's certainly very beautiful, and I hope uh, many people who watch it do, do feel that sense with you. Um, as you're doing all of these practices, the 176 times, what are you thinking as you're going through it? Well, I was hoping to send out a message for, for the Persian New Year, which, is, which happens at the exact second of the start of spring, at the exact second of spring equinox. So um, that can, as I said, like spring is a symbol of renewal. And end of the dark days, I think that's what we need. That's what we need these days to end these dark days around the world. So I thought that's gonna be um, very helpful to, um, to link with each individual soul when I was practicing this dance and, um, and ask them to wish for us to bring all of these good, good days to this world. And we all need to have a brighter and better world. Absolutely. And we can see in the video that you were dancing in Stanley Park. What was the reaction like uh, as you were doing that from some of the people that were, were nearby? Yeah, well, we did it like on a weekday, so uh, we didn't have a lot of people in Stanley Park. Uh, but because it was about the spring, I wanted to be in close connection with Mother Nature when I'm doing it. So I thought maybe this is a good way for Mother Nature to listen to us as well. On Sunday, March 20th, at 8.33 a.m., which is the exact moment of the start of spring, I would like to invite everyone who is watching to join the 176 beautiful souls in a wish for a world filled with peace, fairness, morality, and justice. Happy Noruz. All right, thank you so much for uh, telling us your story today, Samir. Really appreciate it. Thank you very much, Leon. This is our Vancouver. If you want to see some live music, six-time Juno Award nominee Harry Manx marries East, West, classical and blues, and Hindustani and North American sounds. He's on stage with the Yaletown String Quartet at the ACT Theatre on March 26th. The land of broken dreams Senorita and British pop singer Dua Lipa plays Rogers Arena April 1st, and that's not an April Fool's joke. I got you, moonlight, you're my starlight. I need you all night. Come on, dance with me. I'm levitating you. Hey, I'm Grant Lawrence from CBC Music. I'd like to share with you a new twin-powered band on the rise out of Kitchener, Ontario, that everyone should follow. They're called Soft Cult. That is Kitchener Band's soft cult with Young Forever. The band is made up of guitarist and singer Mercedes Arnhorn, along with her twin sister, drummer Phoenix Arnhorn. Now, more than a decade before they formed Soft Cult, the twins found musical success in their teens with their first band, a pop punk fueled group called Courage My Love. That band got signed to a major label deal when the twins were just 16 years old. That is the Juno-nominated band Courage My Love with Bridges. That's going back to 2011, featuring the Arnhorn Twins. So if we skip ahead to 2020, the Twins were looking for a fresh start and feeling inspiration from their 90s heroes in activist riot girl bands like Bikini Kill and Bratmobile, the Twins formed Soft Cult, a band that seamlessly combines 
the sounds of alt-rock, grunge, shoegazer, and dream pop into, quote, music with a message, unquote. According to Soft Cult, that message is pro-feminism, social activism, self-empowerment, and gender neutrality. From their new EP, Year of the Snake, that is Soft Cult from Kitchener with their latest single, Gaslight. The band says that song is about raising awareness of the manipulation technique known as gaslighting and how it can alter one's perception of reality. Well, the reality is that song has done very well on the CBC Music Top 20 and Gaslight by Soft Cult is the song that you need to add to your 2022 social awareness playlist. Thanks a lot to Candle Osborne for the shirt. I'm Grant Lawrence. I'll check in with you again next week. Coming up, the man who goes by at Van City Reynolds on Twitter and Instagram. Actor Ryan Reynolds talks about his humble beginnings in our city. Welcome back to our Vancouver. I'm Leanne Young. Equally at home in every genre, Vancouver's Ryan Reynolds is a top Hollywood star. He's also an entrepreneur and active in charity work, including raising money for Ukrainian refugees. Reynolds recently sat down with our Ian Hanamansing to talk about his work and where he established his moral compass. We're going to play a game. Sure, um, and, I love games. I'm going to show you three pictures. <laughs> and uh, you get one point if you identify the picture, and you get five points if you come up with an interesting story about the picture. Wow, yeah. I like this game already. Yeah, so here you go. Here's the first picture. First picture, that is Kitsilano Secondary School. Yeah. That is my high school. Yeah, so you get the one point for that. Tell me something interesting about your time in high school. Uh, in high school, uh, okay, terrified to go to. I went, I, I actually was at a school called uh, Prince of Wales before that. I did an amazing program there where I, that's sort of where I became an environmentalist to a certain degree, which was this program called Trek, mm -hmm. Clatwa Trek they had, which is kids get to immerse themselves in the outdoors. They spend six months doing school and then six months, you just six months, you do a year's worth of schoolwork in six months and then the rest of the time you're outside. And amazing, amazing program. But then I had to go back into the main school system and I was like a real introvert as a kid I did not like school I did not like the social pressures I didn't like the dynamics see that, uh, that sounds like it might be myth making because you seem hardly introverted now but you really yeah. were like that okay this is a bit of a tangent but <laughs> I, I am I have always had this sort of thing where you know like I, I, I think about Dave Letterman sometimes when mm -hmm. I would go on the Dave Letterman show and and that's a big talk show to go on. And, you know, he doesn't obviously doesn't do the show anymore, but I remember he was always the guy that, that other performers when they were going to the show had some reverence for, a uh, little bit of fear, because you don't know what's gonna happen. Mm -hmm. uh, if he doesn't like you, how does this go? You know, that sort of thing. And I used to stand behind that curtain as they were announcing my name and thinking, I'm gonna die. Like I'm actually, when that curtain opens, I'm either just gonna like fall out of it like a, <laughs> like a comedic corpse bashing mm -hmm. off the ground, or I'm just gonna projectile vomit over everybody. And as soon as he called my name and I start to step out there, I noted that this sort of little guy takes over. And this little guy's like confident and kind of, he can throw a joke around here and there and all that stuff. And then I realized that that's the same guy that is like responsible for my career, responsible for a lot of the things that I get to do. He's, he's not necessarily real, the real me, but he keeps me safe and protects me. So that, that, that guy has kind of been around since high school. And you could try to turn them on and off um, a lot better as I got older. But when I was younger, I, I struggled with that stuff. And I and I don't look back at it with a boo-hoo story. I mean, you know, every I've learned more from failures and insecurities and all sorts of things than I've ever learned from successes in life. Second uh, picture. Second picture. Oh gosh, I would. 
Now I would say that that's probably a not up to date photo of the 25th and Oak Safeway store. It Am is I completely right? up to date picture. My wife took this picture this week. What? Can I see it? Yeah. That's the old stomping grounds. You know, I used to face this fridge out. I, like yeah. I would have to make sure everything was just perfectly smooth and all the labels out. I loved working at Safeway. I worked uh, a lot of the time I worked there was midnight to 8 a.m. The sort of graveyard shift which was interesting. And, I, and then I moved to cashier. I did everything in that store. I, you cashier. were a cashier there? Yeah, I was also a cashier. I also bagged groceries. I used to bag Sarah McLaughlin's groceries. Wow. And I always noted that she was incredibly kind to everybody that she met in that store. Didn't have to be. No one even knew it was her. Half the time she had like a toque pulled down and I, was, I always knew that was her. And yeah, she was awesome. Again, full five points full five for points. that. Okay, final picture here, Landmark, Vancouver. Limo, well that's the viaduct right there. Yeah. Hey, yeah, I wanna shoot. That was my first sort of foray into producing, properly producing a movie and managing budgets and all kinds of stuff. And boy, that Georgia Viaduct saved our life. It really did because we didn't, we had to cut all these huge action sequences and replace spectacle with character, which later in my life became an, an enormous lesson in marketing and every other business I would pursue, that necessity being the mother invention is the greatest greatest creative tool you could ever have. But a lot of those lessons were kind of forged in 2015 as I sat on that Georgia Viaduct trying to figure out how the hell I'm going to get through this movie on the paltry amount of money they've given us to shoot it. So actor, uh, entrepreneur, creative person, and philanthropist. I mean, you and your wife seem to have really embraced charitable giving. And so that video, for example, uh, for the Governor General's Award at the end, there's that those credits that roll or the thank yous, basically. Mm. I assume that a lot of people in your business give a certain amount of money, but the thing that with you is that it just seems so thoughtful mm. and and varied. And I just wonder, this is actually my wife's question for you. Mm -hmm. she, she was wondering, where does this come from? Where, where in your life or your wife's life mm -hmm. did the inspiration come to be so charitable? Um, oh boy, I don't, you know, I don't know. I mean, I, I think that, that we're, you know, part of why I've been successful, I think, in my business life is, is being somewhat self-aware. And, and I understand the idea that when you extract a lot from a system you need to put back in, put some back in as well so um, part of it comes from that I can't you know safely say that I would enjoy my position in life if I wasn't sharing it um, you know not just sharing wealth but also sharing power and you know, stepping aside where appropriate as well um, and you can do all these things and you know at the end of the day like you're still doing all right yeah. <laughs> you know it doesn't change you know much for your own personal situation other than it really feels great but typically the 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 organizations that we give to and the organizations that we support and, and the foundations that we create are usually something to do with sustainability you know sustainability in communities um sustainability in in you know infrastructure to create jobs for folks who don't normally have that access or opportunity to those jobs and um, that's the stuff I really love. Sick Kids Foundation is a big one that we, we do stuff for every year, uh, you know, and that is a sustainable way to give. It isn't a one-time thing. It sort of just it grows and grows and grows. And I think, I think of, you know, sharing, I don't want to call it charity, but sharing as an investment. They're all just investments, you know, and might not necessarily return dollars to you, but they'll, they'll, make, they'll make the world a better place. They'll make Canada a better place. And at the end of the day, that's kind of the goals like I grew up I grew up here and I want it to be better you're having a moment uh, it's been going on for a while but it's still like we're kind of a lot of success right you have a lot of success now in a business that can be really fickle mm. and so do you wonder if in five or ten years all this magic will still be as potent as it is right now you know, Ian, I've never had like a high expectation of anything. There's no part of me that's like, I deserve this or I expect <laughs> this. Um, you know, anybody that's managed to come as far as I've come in this in this business, it's a it's a certainly hard work is there, but there's a huge component of, of, of luck and circumstance and being in the right place at the right time and and then also being a person who is given access and opportunity at an at an early age that I was born into and understanding that privilege and what that is. So I've never I my highest goal 
in show business was to be the wacky neighbor in a sitcom. Quite literally. Like, if I had go to Los Angeles, I started an improv comedy. If I mm -hmm. could go to Los Angeles, I could get a job as the wacky neighbor in a sitcom, I would be set. That was all I ever really wanted. So everything else that's happened, and it's all happened quite slowly, has been a kind of an aggregate. Um, if you want to call it fame or any of that stuff, it's always been very slow. Today we honor, with the 2,596 star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame, Ryan Reynolds. By virtue of that fact, it's it's much easier to kind of watch and regulate and keep your head screwed on right because it's not happening. I don't know how these young kids who just have this overnight success that is like a tidal wave, I don't know how they keep their heads, and, and oftentimes they don't, you know, and I, and I see the pitfalls of, of, of what this business can be like when it, when it happens sort of in a flash flood kind of sense. So for me, I was very lucky. I wasn't try. I was trying to make things happen fast at times, and other times I would just push it away. Um, so it happened very slowly, and it was in a, in a way kind of gave, gave me a sort of a, the benefit of immersion uh, that that was you know that not everyone gets. I wondered what you'd seem like in person, and you do seem very level-headed. So <laughs> you just that's, wait. That's, <laughs> I am going to toss all of this expensive camera gear around as soon as I leave. It's just one of the things I like to do at the end of an interview <laughs> to create more of a myth. Excellent. Like, oh, God, totally normal on camera and then just lost it. We'll keep rolling the then. Yeah, yeah. I roll for it. It'll be really, it'll be great, great footage. Great ratings, I think. Coming up, 40 years of SkyTrain chimes ringing out at each stop in Vancouver. Justin McElroy looks back at the humble beginnings of the major transit system. You are watching our Vancouver. I'm Leanne Young. It has been 40 years since construction began on Vancouver's SkyTrain system. The rapid transit line was built for Expo 86 with hopes the technology would be used around the world. Justin McElroy looks back on that day and whether the dreams of 40 years ago turned into reality. It began, as most mega projects do, with a photo op. The all-Canadian system will become one of the most efficient and sought-after transit operations in North America, according to the politicians, with many other centers watching the construction of the Vancouver line with great interest. From a one-kilometer demonstration line along Terminal Avenue to a 21-kilometer line from Waterfront to New Westminster, the original Expo line got finished on budget and in time for Expo 86. But that wasn't guaranteed. I mean, the biggest question was, were we going to be ready? Mike Richard was hired by TransLink during the construction of the original line and still works for them today. There was some uncertainty as to the reliability of the trains initially um, and the automatic train control because it had never been um, done, certainly not in, the, in, in, in BC and Western Canada. The linear induction motor, the lack of a driver, the elevated rail, it created a unique system that politicians hoped would be exported across the world. But despite its success in Vancouver, SkyTrain didn't really spread that much. Am I surprised that it isn't in other cities? Yeah, I am, because it's, it is a good system. But a lot of the other North American cities have a legacy system, so they're, that's what they're used to. And that unique transit system has always had its unique sound. Created on a Yamaha DX7 and originally played on a cassette, the sound was originally recorded at Little Mountain Studio, the recording home of somewhat more internationally famous tracks. But none played as much in Vancouver as that three-tone jingle. They sat down and they went through a whole bunch of different sound options. Uh, they wanted something that sounded a little bit natural but also modern. Uh, take advantage of the digital playback technology that was new at the time, so you could have something that sounded a bit more realistic than, say, a buzzer or some other mechanical sound on the train. It's now a trademark sound, the one inspired by classical music. The sound engineer was interviewed a few years ago, and he indicated that they, he actually tried to guide it towards the opening three notes of uh, Fanfare for a Common Man. And really, isn't that perfect? An ode to the common man, moving the common person from place to place, for a transit system that has proven to be very uncommon, but very Vancouver. Justin McElroy, CBC News, Vancouver. 
We just marked International Women's Day, a day to appreciate the many contributions by women in our world. The lives of women in Canada have changed over the years, and so have their expectations for a good life where they can do any job they want, even if they have children. Let's go back 30 years to an all-girl math class. It's a story from our CBC archives. It's 9 a.m., the beginning of another school day. Across the country, young people are being groomed to take their place in the Canada of the future. Most expect a bright future, a good education, a rewarding career, a happy marriage, a financially secure adult life. Well, I plan to be married by then and maybe get married about 25, 26. Um, maybe just starting a family, maybe of one pretty young, still preschool. And I'll have a career and I hope to be in the science field, in the health sciences, maybe um, nutritionist or dietitian or something along that line. And plan to own a house, car, maybe two. Um, maybe have a dog. Well, you know, a husband's 2.5 kids, <laughs> the usual. Do you see yourself still working at that point uh, as well as having a family? I would say, yeah, after at least an 18-month break for each child. Yeah. Right, so you see yourself going back into the workforce afterward? Yeah, definitely. You don't see any problem with, with doing that? It might be difficult to get back into the workforce? No, no. I like my independence, too. Uh, I think it's good for a woman when she has her own family to know how to... something breaks down in the house, she can do it herself. Do you see yourself uh, sometime in the future maybe working uh, in a field like this? No. No, I just, it's, I don't know, I was interested in just taking it for once. More like a hobby. Yeah. What do you think you will be doing uh, with your life? Um, hairdressing. Yeah. 90 equals 180. What theorem says that? What theorem tells you that? Corresponding to... This all-girls math class is another way of tackling the problem. By taking boys out of the class, the girls feel less intimidated and more confident in their abilities. For these students, it's the last year in which math is compulsory. The idea is to get them to stick with math so they'll be able to handle the kind of jobs that will be available in the future. It seems to be working. This has helped me a lot. It's like kept me going and it's been more interesting than being just in a regular class. I think it's, it's good for a lot of people. There are a lot of people of girls who are afraid to speak out in classes with, that are co-ed. And I don't know, for me, it's also raised my marks because I feel more comfortable talking to, to other people and asking more questions. The fact that teenage girls are in many cases overly optimistic about the future doesn't come as a complete surprise. Obviously, some schools are making efforts to inform students of the realities of the adult world and to prepare them for a life which may not turn out quite the way they expect. But clearly, more has to be done to open their eyes. The challenge is to do more without totally dampening their spirit and enthusiasm for the future. For The Journal, I'm Doug James. When we bring you stories here at CBC Vancouver, we have award-winning photographers out capturing images that say so much. Still images add context and bring a lot more to the understanding of an event or an issue. Here are some of the latest from what happened this past week. And that's all for our Vancouver this week. I'm Leanne Young. Thanks for joining us. Have a good one.